We've got a MEAC showdown between the Maryland Eastern Shore Hawks and the Howard Fison. With former Georgetown head coach John Thompson III, I'm Doug Sherman. So glad you could be with us here tonight for a chance to see one of the best one-two punches in the country. The first punch being thrown by that guy, R.J. Cole. A, a dynamic duo indeed. R.J. Cole, last year's Rookie of the Year in the MEAC, outstanding shooter, has the ball in his hands most of the time, and when he's setting people up, a lot of times it goes to this young man, Charles Williams, the 17 MEAC Rookie of the Year. And so we got two Rookie of the Years back-to-back, -back, very athletic, strong player, scores. We're going to have fun watching these two tonight. Charles is 6'6", a junior from Richmond. R.J. Cole listed at 6'1", a sophomore from Union, New Jersey. And, Coach, you think both of these guys, if they were, were to transfer out, not that they're going to or want to, they could play at a much higher level? No, no, no. No, no. I, I word it much differently than you just did. I think these two guys at just about any program in the country would be rotational players at worst. These are the two very, very outstanding players here tonight. Gotcha. Well, they are uh, quite... A one-two punch, Cole averaging nearly 21 points per game. Charles Williams at 19 per game. Top two scores in the MEAC, and this is Cole with the basketball to get things underway. Cole gets the first shot. Out of bounds to Maryland Eastern Shore. And Chad Lott's the other guy you keep your eye on for Howard. He's a 6'4 transfer from Rice University who has really become that third option for Coach Kevin Nickelberry. He's a pretty good third option. And he's someone, when they take the ball, when Coach Nickelberry gives Cole a blow, you'll see Lott move to the point position. And so he's, you know, he's a versatile player that can do just about everything. Maryland Eastern Shore led by its backcourt. Brian Aredia. Ryan and Dino. Traveling violation against Gabriel Jimphy, a junior from Brampton, Ontario. Give it back to the Bison. There's the interim head coach for Maryland Eastern Shore, Cliff Reed. He is a longtime veteran both as a player and as a head coach in the MEAC. He has started Bethune-Cookman as a player back in the late 80s and early 90s and then had a successful run as head coach at his alma mater. And Coach Reed is an outstanding teacher. Watching him in practice, knowing the, the things he's teaching and instructing these young men. Outstanding teacher at Maryland Eastern Shore right now. And there you see a little bit of the versatility we talked about earlier a lot. He'll go in the post. He'll score off the drive. He'll score at many different points on, on the floor. He's a real good rebounder for his size as well. Nearly five boards per game to go along with 15 points a night. And, and you'll see Howard is going to play soft on just about everyone except Andino. I mean, with, with Arruda, you see they're, they're not really guarding him at all. They know most of their players are going to come. To, and that's the one player that you better stay close to because he can get warmed up. Yeah, Brian Andino went for 18 on Saturday at Norfolk State. He's got the first three here tonight. Fifth-year senior from Fort Lauderdale. Lott absorbs the contact and will get a chance for three. Isaac Taylor picks up the personal. Previous possession, Lot goes on the block and shows you his post-up game. This time a little hezzy, sees the mismatch. Strong finish. He's finishing through contact right there. He can score many different points on the court and then come down the other end and guard you. Out of Bird High School in Shreveport, Louisiana. Says he's interested in medicine. Going to medical school, potentially. He completes the three-point play. We're deadlocked early here in D.C. And you see, Maryland Eastern Shore is not going to be in a rush. They're going to go through their motion, and then in the last 15 seconds, actually look for a scoring opportunity. Now, if they get you in transition, they'll take that. But once they're in the half court, they're going to work it down, work it down, and see what they get from there. Cannon Bartley strong to the bucket, and he will head to the line. Well, there's a possession they were looking to get. Work the shot clock down to 27, and then get yourself to the free throw line. And you see Coach Nickelberry's a little frustrated. Yeah. He just said, did you, did you listen to Scout? In Scout report today, they talked about Bartley and said he's going to drive. He's going to drive right. He's not going to shoot. Now, that's great for a coach to say. I can sit here and, and give you a great scouting report. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can't stop the players from doing the one or two things <laughs> that, that they can do. You know? And what recourse does he have? 
at, at the, to, who Coach Nickelberry? Yeah. There's a, there's about eight other guys sitting on that bench. Exactly. They can get in there. That <laughs> maybe they listened a little bit. One out of two for Bartley, the sophomore from Miami. And when these two teams met earlier this month in a game that was, well, rather one-sided over in uh, Princess Anne, Maryland, the final margin was 40 points in favor of the Bison. So if you're the Hawks, how on earth do you overcome that tonight, John? Well, you just throw that game out. I mean, you, you try to find some snippets to learn from it. You, don't, you definitely do not dwell on a 40-point loss. The biggest fear is at the other end of the court, you know, the Bison come in here thinking, okay, we just need to show up and win this game. They had an extremely spirited practice yesterday. Coach Nickelberry was all over them trying to make sure that they stayed focused, stayed locked in. You know, because that's the thing. You win the game 79 to 39 away, you know, on, on their home court. Now you're coming back home. And so it's, it's whether the Bison show up to play. Off the bounce, Lott swishes the mid-range jumper. Mr. Lott is showing up to play. Indeed he has one of nine high school players in the state of Louisiana to earn a nomination in the 2015 McDonald's All-America class. And as mentioned, he uh, played a year for the Rice Owls before transferring, and uh, it was the HBCU experience as much as anything that was part of the equation for Chad to want to come here to Howard University and be part of the Bison. Nice look and drive by Brian Arudia, the junior from Chihuahua, Mexico. You see, Cole, people try to deny him. They try to speed him up. He plays at the pace he wants to play at. And then the lefty, that, that jump is that jump is sweet. The preseason player of the year in the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference. His first three points of the night give the buys in the lead. And you see the Hawks, they're going to take their time. They're going to take their time, see if they can get a pin down for Dino. If not, see if they get someone going to the basket. Arudia, cross-court pass to the corner. Jim Fee nails the three. Well, all right. That's his, that's his second three-point attempt for the year. He's one for two. That's he's not one bad. For two. <laughs> well, if you can make shots, you can hang around, and this won't be a 40-point game if the Hawks continue to run good offense as they have through the first five minutes. Long rebound. Off the hands of Chad Lott, out of bounds. Back to the Hawks, who will have it when we return. You see, they moved it around. They get it to Jim Fee. This is second three of the year. Look good. Splash. What food group would you put pork rinds in? What happened? There are lots of questions out there. I don't know. What to serve at game time should never be one of them. Farm Rich, it's real life good. Back inside Bird Gymnasium, the home of the Howard Bison, where the visitors from Maryland Eastern Shore have the early 9-7 lead. Doug Sherman along with John Thompson. And the Hawks coach have had to make do with out a number of their players injured, and most notably these days, A.J. Cheeseman. No, without a doubt. They've had a lot of injuries. The most one that's hurting the most right now is Cheeseman, their leading scorer. And on a team where they're, they're challenged to get points, they're challenged to find points, to lose your leading scorer, to lose the one of the few post presence that you, presences that you have, it's, it's without a doubt hurt this team. You know, and Coach Reed has had to tweak and adjust at, on the fly. And hopefully they get that young man back this weekend. And, and so their, their, their sets, their rotations will start to look a little more like Coach Reed wants them to look. He suffered a broken left hand in the game at Pittsburgh and uh, played in only 11 games this year, averaging about 12 and a half points per game. And there's no question in Coach's mind that he is their best player and will make a huge difference when he's able to get back. Didn't need surgery, just had a cast on it for a while, and we saw him getting up shots today during shoot-around. Certainly not within the general practice, but doing his own thing. It looks like he's on course to, as you mentioned, perhaps get back on the floor this weekend. Again, with a shot clock down at two, a jump shot nailed, this time by Kanan Bartley. Kanan Bartley. This, this might be a night of first, um, you know, because we're looking at Bartley, who also has had one three on the year. Yeah, one for 11, though. That's not as good a percentage <laughs> as the right. other guy. 
But, you know, Bartley's feeling it. He's coming off a career-best 15 points Saturday at Norfolk State, and so you throw the stats out. If you're feeling it from game to game, day to day, why not put it up? No, and I tell you, this start has been exactly what Coach Reed would want and exactly what Coach Nickelberry doesn't want. You know, you have a Howard team that's very flat. Offensively, you know, normally they have very good movement, very good motion. Today they're kind of a, a little stagnant. And then you have a Maryland Eastern Shore team that normally can't throw the ball in the water standing on the pier, mm -hmm. and they're making shots left and right so far. Well, to illustrate your analogy there, Maryland Eastern Shore coming into this shoots as a team only 27% from three-point land. First three points for Charles Williams, averaging nearly 19 per game, and the Bison back within a point. I'm guessing during your uh, tenures both at Princeton and at Georgetown, in your round robin both in the Ivy League and in the Big East Conference, you put it on an opponent early in the year and then had to turn around and face them later in the year. Was there one thing in particular, Coach, that you tried to impress upon your team not to overlook this opponent the second time around. How about that? <laughs> As they, he called it, though. He called it, ladies <laughs> and gentlemen. I heard him. Um, you know, you, you, you just talk about it, and you hope your guys are mature enough to understand. And, and we'll talk about it as the broadcast goes on. But this is a young Howard team. And so getting them to understand that what happened a couple of weeks ago doesn't mean anything. Chad Lott now with seven points. Howard back within two. It's down this end. Can they have the discipline when the shot clock gets under 15? Because that's Maryland Eastern Shore is not looking to score until it gets under 15. So can Howard be disciplined enough for the full shot clock? Arudia kills the dribble. Shot clock at six. Now Arudia creates. And it's a shot clock violation. Right here, shot clock running down. Right here, he says, glass. <laughs> <laughs> you got better ears than I do, Coach. <laughs> Jim Fee and Arudia go out. And it'll, it'll, it'll just be quick blows for them. I mean, they're, they're under, we've talked about the injuries of Maryland Eastern Shore. They're undermanned. You know, they're not going to be on that bench too long. Get a quick blow, get some water. Maybe at, after the, the, the next time out, they're coming right back in. Off the bounce. Good looking shot by Williams, cleared by Bartley. 12 30 remaining first half here at Howard University in Washington, D.C. A lot of contact. And a jump ball, a held ball is called. Good defense by Chad Lott. Very good defense. And, and, and that time, maybe they paid attention to the scout report a little bit. You know <laughs> that he's been, the only thing is he switched, Bartley switched it up on him. He went left that time. Coach Nickelberry said he's only going right. You know, back in high school, Chad Lott oftentimes would match up defensively, having to check a guy named Cameron Lard. You know who Cameron Lard is at Iowa State? Absolutely. Big guy, physical specimen. So Chad Lott is not going to back down from anybody he has to defend here tonight. Oh, no, we didn't, we didn't say he was scared. No. In the scouting report, Coach Nickelberry didn't say he was scared. He just said he wasn't going to shoot. <laughs> so a good defensive sequence for Howard. And the Bison with a chance to tie or retake the lead here with 12-24 on the clock. Jalen Jones is coming to the game for the Bison. Also in there, Andre... Toure, a freshman from Paris. And Raymond Bethay, a freshman from Atlantic City, New Jersey, getting his first run of the night for the Bison. A lot of freshmen playing significant minutes for Coach Nickelberry. Freshmen and sophomores. Our next Super Tuesday doubleheader features two great rivalry games. Number 11, Kansas takes on Texas in Austin, 7 Eastern. Then at 7th rank, Kentucky and Vanderbilt at historic Memorial Gymnasium. Both games are live on the ESPN app, so you can watch anywhere. Super Tuesday is presented by Boost Mobile. Torre, strong to the baseline, had his shot blocked. Bison just keep working, and we're tied at 14. And, you know, that, that's what Toure does. He's, he's an energy player. He's a hustle player. He plays hard. 
Coach Nickelberry, you know, you know, I, I came to practice the other day, and I knew Coach Nickelberry thought highly of Toure because he was all over his behind the whole practice. Mm-hmm. Yelled at him, screamed at him. And so you, you can tell Nick is trying to push him to a place where Toure may not want to go on his own just yet. He was all over that kid in practice. Well, we said he's from Paris, France, but he played his high school basketball at St. Benedict's Prep in New Jersey. Good looking shot by Isaac Taylor, his first two points. Stoppage in play, and we'll take a break with 11 21 remaining in the half. The young man, the freshman, you said played at St. Benedict's in Jersey, high school powerhouse. Energy player. Calm. ESPN's exclusive presentation of college basketball is brought to you by State Farm. Talk to an agent today at 800 State Farm. I'm guessing as a longtime member of those folks who live here in the uh, D.C. area, you've been to the Lincoln Memorial a time or two, Coach. I've been to the Lincoln Memorial a time or two. You know what happens, though? You live here, and, and the only time you go to the, to the, the monuments is mm-hmm. when guests come in town and of say, course. hey, I want to go down there. Like somebody in New York City who never goes to the Empire State Building unless they've got family or friends visiting from out of town. Absolutely. Along with John Thompson the third, I'm Doug Sherman. Hey, you see the coach's resume. Proud Princeton alumnus and former head coach of the Princeton Tigers as well. Now in your second year with us here at ESPN. Absolutely. So glad to have you. And I like what you said uh, as we were leaving earlier today after shoot around. This is a rare home game for you. Broadcasters don't always get uh, home games. Most everything's a road game. I know. No one told me that when I was look, think, <laughs> when I was thinking about the field. It's like you're going to be on the road all the time. This is this is the first home game I've had in two years. Sleep in your own bed, night before and night of. Not a bad deal. The Bison are playing this game like they think they can just turn it on. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, they're, they're sleepwalking a little bit. There's not enough motion on offense. They're stagnant. Mary Lisa Shore goes to, looks like a zone right now. But they knocks down the three. Another part of that freshman class for Howard. Young man can shoot. Puts the ball in the basket. They went through a shooting drill yesterday where he just shot the lights out. See, they're going to sit right at that three-point line on your router. And again, shot clock down to single digits. They have been shooting extremely well with the shot clock down. Here's a long three, and that's the first missed triple of the night for the Hawks. Substitution. That's the risk you run when you use this tactic that occasionally I would think you're just going to run out of time. Yeah, but you know what? They don't have the depth because of injuries and the personnel to fly up and down the court with Howard. And so slowing Howard down, you know, you see we're 10 minutes in, they're down one point. Um, you know, we said the last game they played was a 40-point game. And so slowing Howard down and limiting Howard to one shot, which they have done, uh, you know, you, you you have to take that chance. You, no you coach doubt. to win. Coach Reed doesn't necessarily want to play like this, but this is what this is what gives his team the best chance to win. And it helps when you're shooting three for three, six for nine overall from the floor. Rudy, backdoor pass. Jones is fouled, and will head to the foul line. And you know we've talked about. Maryland Eastern Shore has made some, some shots that they traditionally don't don't make. This young man right here, Tyler Jones, he needs to get involved with the game. He's, you know, since Cheeseman's been out, he's been their main primary scorer. He, you know, he can make the little mid-range shot, and he's just been kind of floating so far. They need to get find a way to get him involved in this game. And a junior out of Holy Spirit High School in Atlantic City has averaged over the last five games coming in 11 points per, and that is four or five points better than he had been doing previously. And when they get Cheeseman back, you figure they'll be better for it, not just to have Cheeseman back, but other guys will have played bigger roles and they can settle back into their roles. And everyone else will be more open. <laughs> you know, we, we talked about that earlier with Andino, who's we said, already said a terrific shooter. And he was saying with, with Cheeseman out, all of a sudden, 
I have a, a chest in my, a head in my chest every time on offense. People are paying much more attention to him because he's one of the few guys that can consistently make a shot for this team. Right, and Dino is no less a shooter now than he's been in previous years, but he's only shooting 31%. For his career, he's 38%. As a freshman, he led the league at 42%, Coach. But again, that's because he was farther down on the opponent's scouting reports. Yeah, the list of the injuries being dealt with by Cliff Reed, the head coach of the Hawks. I mean, that's an that's an exorbitant amount of injuries for one season to have to deal with. It, 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 you go through that, and every week you're, you're reinventing your team. Someone goes out, you have to find a, a new way to win games. And we just saw in Andino exactly what we are just talking about, right? Absolutely. And, and, and you saw from Jim Fee right there what he brings to the table. Andino gets that shot. Good shot for him. Doesn't go in. The hustle play by, by Jim Fee. They're trying to get Andino a shot right now. They go right back to the stagger. Seven to shoot. Jones trying to back his way down. Drew a triple team and drew the foul. Well, Jones is every bit 6'7", 200. And he's a handful for Howard to deal with inside. Yeah, you know, and they don't need to triple. But, but when Jones catches the ball in the post and he goes into his move, most of the time he's, he's going to shoot it. And, and so since he's not, since he doesn't want to be a good passer out of the post, when he gets it, Howard's going to come and double right away. That's a young man who has twice in his college career has gone for as many as 28 points, so he can fill it out. Absolutely. Illegal screen. It'll come back the other way. And that's one of those points of emphasis this year. You know, the refs are called more often than not when you set those screens and you pop out, pick and pop early, they're calling that foul. What do coaches think when they hear from the NCAA in the offseason, here are our points of emphasis for the year upcoming? Yeah, I think different, different coaches will have a different response depending on what it is. What every coach uniformly wants is just consistency. Like, don't start off the first 10 games of the season and you're really going to stress the points of emphasis, and then now all of a sudden this time of year it gets around and they start slacking off and slacking off. You know, if, if that's a point of emphasis, emphasis, make it a point of emphasis the entire year. And coaches and players will adjust. We, we will adjust. Lot having a real nice first half for the Bison. He's got nine to lead all scores. Howard back within one. And that's the beauty of Coach Nickelberry's team, I think. You know, obviously Cole and Williams get a lot of the attention. They get most of the attention. But you have Lott, who's a veteran player, who's been through the wars, and, and several other young freshmen that can score. There are multiple people that can put points on the board. Much like Clifford Reed, Kevin Nickelberry also has been a head coach elsewhere in the uh, MEAC. Spent three years as head coach at Hampton. Another shot clock violation is Arudia did not get it off. 2019, our score. After losing by 40 in their first matchup, Coach Reed's team is here to play tonight. Soon. Come find me. I can't wait to meet you. Why wait to meet someone great? Text free to 370-370 and get your seven days free on Match Now. The maroon and gray of Maryland Eastern Shore has come here to D.C. tonight, Coach, and really found the range early on. No, and if they can sustain this, they have, you know, if you use boxing terminology, a, pun a puncher's chance, a shooter's chance. You know, that they're making threes, which traditionally they don't do, and, they, and you look up and all of a sudden they're up one. Now their defense gets a lot better, a lot more energy. Let it fly, baby. It's going in tonight. Maybe this is one of those days. Never know. Jim Fee and Dino and Arudia each have three-pointers. They are three for five and lead by a point. Lock pass to the corner for an open three that's buried by Charles Williams. Assist by Lot. He's, he's quietly having his imprint, his fingerprints all over this game. And I'm, and I'm talking about Lot right now. Great assist right there. Uh, Maryland Eastern Shores, they're going to a matchup zone which has really slowed Howard down. Howard's trying to figure it out. Too much dribbling, I think. Not enough passing and cutting. Seven on the shot clock. Bartley calls for a screen. Nice rebound by Williams. And there you see Williams. Williams 
Yeah, he's not just a scorer. He, he will get in there and do some of the dirty things. He's coming off a 30-point performance. A lot is headed towards a 30-point performance. <laughs> Lots, like, fellas, why didn't you talk about me in the opening? <laughs> Well, again, he uh, comes in averaging nearly 15 per game. He is five of six from the floor tonight, John. And his, his maturity, you also see, he calms this Howard team down. Well, Coach Nickelberry says of Chad Lott, I don't know if I've met or coached a more competitive kid. And, and, and you see that out there. You see that on the court. You see it manifest itself in different ways. You know, nice assist right there. We've seen him post up. We've seen him drive. Gets to the rim, nice little step back right there. He scored in many different ways. He's helped his teammates off to a very good first half, Mr. Lott. Well, you know, coming out of high school, among those who were in pursuit, Eric Musselman, who had first seen him when he was an assistant coach at LSU, and then uh, when he was at Nevada, he wanted young Mr. Lott to join him out in Reno. Chose instead to go to Houston to play for the Rice Owls, and after a coaching change, decided to transfer here to Howard University. Coach. And now with Cole on the bench, sorry, Cole on the bench, you see him running the point for, for Coach Nickelberry. Didn't mean to cut you off there. No. First of many times we'll just step on each other's toes tonight. At the free throw line is Kyle Foster, a sophomore from Hampton, Virginia, who twice was cut from the Bethel High School Bruins varsity as a ninth and 10th grader. It crushed his dreams of playing Division One at the time. He struggled with his confidence, but he kept working at it. You know, USA Today wound up profiling his journey. He went on to Hampton Christian Academy, played for former Demon Deacon Tony Rutland, kept working, coach, kept working, and here he is as a Division One ball player. Hey, persistence pays off. And look, it's, it, it's, it's no shame to be cut as a freshman from Bethel. You know, Bethel's, one of Bethel's most famous uh, former athletes, students. You got me. Mr. Allen Iverson. He was pretty good. He was pretty good. Of course, the, uh, the famous story about Michael Jordan also being cut from his high school basketball team. But again, if you're a 7th, 8th, ninth grader, no shame in that. No shame in that, man. But both of them, they're not, not, not to compare Foster to Michael Jordan, but you, you get better, you work, you don't pout about it, and then good things happen. Jones with a soft pass, shot clock down to three. And even though the Hawks get it back, tough shot again, and it's another shot clock violation because violation. it failed to hit the rim. That's the fourth fourth of the half. The, the Bison's defense, you know, they're, they're swarming on all penetration. They want Merrill Easton Shore to throw it out because they don't believe that they have shooters. And that's the fourth shot clock violation. Uh, uh, of the half, yet they're only down five. Ball knocked out of bounds. Howard will keep it. And it's a big point in the game. You know, the Hawks have done a real nice job through the first 15 minutes of hanging around, but if they're not careful, they can find themselves at halftime down double figures. No, no, this is a, this is a very big point. Like you said, it, it, they can go into halftime feeling pretty good or saying, wow, we played okay and we're still down big. But now their defense is stepping up. Williams rises up. Can't get the roll. Bartley clears. 4.15 remaining in the half. And they've, they've consistently done an outstanding job of limiting a Howard to just one attempt. Howard's just getting one shot. Here goes Bartley. No, he's not going yet. He's going to take his time, get an on ball, and see what happens. Jones sets the screen. Bartley with five on the shot clock is denied by Zion Cousins. Lot back the other way, throws it to the rim, hoping one of his teammates would get there. And he's bailed out with the foul call. No, and, 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 and you said it. Lot step back right there. He's, he's had his fingerprints all over this first half. Action and get a year of Amazon Prime on us. Hurry, this offer ends January 30th. ESPN's exclusive presentation of college basketball is brought to you by Snickers. You're off your game when you're hungry. Eat a Snickers. 
Some of the history here at Howard University at the Burr for both the men's and the women's program. The women played this afternoon, lost their game to Maryland Eastern Shore. And our women's Thursday night showcase this week has number two UConn in Louisville to take on the number three Cardinals, 7 p.m. Eastern on ESPN and the ESPN app, so you can watch anywhere. And, Coach, the Huskies have won 17 in a row against the Cardinals dating back to 1993. I know UConn's good, but Louisville's been real good. I'm surprised they haven't picked off Coach Oriema's club once in the last quarter century. Um, you know, I, I, I'm one of the legions that'll go by and Gino we trust <laughs> and so you know now the law of averages has to catch up with him sooner or later um you know but 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 it's it's story we don't need to talk about what what Connecticut women's basketball has been down through the years no doubt about that now you see the uh, current rankings Baylor number one and then UConn and Louisville Oregon for Notre Dame number five and again you can watch UConn and Louisville coming up Thursday seven o'clock on ESPN. With John Thompson, I'm Doug Sherman. Howard on a 9-0 run to open up this six-point lead, the largest of the night for either side. You know, and Howard's playing man-to-man. -man. And in many ways, it looks like a zone because they're not chasing uh, Maryland Eastern Shore. They're all packed in the lane right there. The gentleman that missed that shot, Mr. Andino, is, is, is in spite of how they've been shooting so far today, that the only threat from the perimeter, consistent threat from Maryland Eastern Shore. Arudia dumps it off. Nice shovel pass inside for the layup. That snaps the run. Give the nice assist to Dante Caldwood. That's what, that's what we got to see from Maryland Eastern Shore. Get some transition baskets. Get some second shots. They're not going to beat Howard just scoring in the half court. They got to find another way to do it. Multiple opportunities. Lot tries to Bang it off of one of the Hawks, but is unable to do it. And so Maryland Eastern Shore gets the ball back. Down by four. And, and there you see Lott gets right in the middle of the paint again. We see something that we haven't seen that much tonight. With the Bison getting two and three opportunities, Maryland Eastern Shore has done a pretty good job uh, tonight of, of limiting Howard to one shot. Now they come down this end. They just go through some early motion. Not really looking to score. Now here's the only point in the shot clock where they're actually trying to score. Rudy, a pass into the corner. Seven to shoot. Now Rudy has got to go. Tough runner off the glass. No. And let's see which way the foul goes. You know. I mean, C.J. Williams went up top to get that rebound. But he did come down swinging those elbows. He did. The whistle, I think, preceded when those elbows started flying. And so now Clarence Armstrong, the lead official, is going to send the uh, players to their respective benches, and they're going to take another look. I don't think he made contact. But, but he, do you need to he, make contact? He definitely was swinging him. Nice rebound right there. Now Rudy is already on his way to the floor when Williams is looking down at him and swinging through. And that's a clean play by Rudy. I mean, he's just going after the ball. He let go. I don't think that was a foul on him. We'll get an explanation soon. You know, a lot of people, you hear the conversation about refs going to the monitors. I don't mind it as long as they get it right. Now, Clarence Armstrong and Orlandis Poole are the two officials Overlooking at the monitor across the way here at Burr Gymnasium. Now they're going to bring in Garrick Shannon to take a look as well. And there you see the NCAA rulebook instant replay on flagrant fouls. And again, I think the call on the floor was that Arudia was called for a reach in. But then as the play continued, they're checking to see if Williams should be assessed a flagrant or not. And it looked like Caldwell actually may have hit Williams in the head on the rebound. See, that's that's why these officials get paid the big bucks. <laughs> they, they're going to have the, they're going to watch the, the replay for five or ten minutes. 
then sit and have a have a meeting. And then Clarence Clarence Armstrong is gonna go clean everything up. There you see the definition of flagrant. You know, because there wasn't any contact, we'll see what we can get an explanation right now. So it's just a common foul. We'll have a one-on-one, -on -one, no flagrant. But I'm guessing that if you are Coach Nickelberry, you might mention to Charles Williams, don't do that again. Well, without a doubt, Coach Nickelberry is going to mention that. He got he got lucky right there. He 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 was lucky that a Rudy was on the way down. And so it's C.J. Williams at the line shooting a one and one. First team all MEAC a year ago, two seasons ago, the rookie of the year in this conference. He's got a pretty looking stroke. He's got a couple of uh, nicknames. We can see on the back of his jersey he goes by C.J. But he also calls himself Bean, as in Kobe Bean Bryant. He likes to shoot, likes to heat up. And uh, his running mate, R.J. Gold, was telling us before practice today, he's a fun-loving guy. He enjoys getting out there and playing with Charles, who's a lot of fun. Well, you know what? C.J. Is, is built, he's wired to score, you know, and, 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 and playing with Cole, you know, they, they have fun playing together. Both of them can score points. But Williams, he's got really good legs. He can get his jump shot off whenever he wants. They're doing a good job on Adino. They're switching all down screens. So when Adino comes off, he's not open. They're not trying to lock in trail. They're just switching out on him. Timeout called by the Hawks with a minute 46 on the clock. Timeout, we'll take a quick 30 second timeout with them and be back to Bird Gymnasium in a moment. Ah, I, mean, I like that. I guess I am pretty smart. Don't let that go to your head, Gary. What's in your wallet? Howard with a six-point lead, and Coach Thompson, they've pretty much been doing it without R.J. Cole, who leads this conference in scoring. He has only two points so far tonight. Yeah, early in the game, it was like the second possession. He, he grabbed his ankle. As we talked about earlier, he has multiple nagging injuries, nothing serious. That, that left ankle being one of them, I don't know whether he tweaked that a little bit. He's back in there now, so everything must be okay. Well, he hasn't been practicing for the most part in several weeks. Scott, as you say, a number of nagging injuries. Says the hip flexor's feeling better, but he's still got a couple of hand and finger injuries along with the ankle. No, it, it's funny. It, it's, it's Coach Nickelberry said he's we're treating him like a pro almost. He just comes, watches a little film, and plays games. <laughs> he hasn't practiced in almost a month. Glances up at the clock, spins away from the double team, puts up a tough shot. And it's the Hawks who come away with it. Yeah, but you know what you see, that freshman Torre, how him chasing down balls, he wasn't successful. He got one, wasn't successful the second time. But I love his energy, his athleticism, his enthusiasm for doing it, the other parts of the game other than take shots. He's going to be a good one for Coach Nickelberry in the future. Yeah, Torre won the MEAC Rookie of the Week in Week 6. Five to shoot. Bartley gives to Jones. How many is that? Five shot clock violations? That's five, violation. That's five violation. shot clock violations. And Jones can make that shot. He, they usually pitch it to him as a trailer right, in, right at the top of the key, but he, he can make that shot. So, you know, I'm going to say that air ball. That one slipped. That's what happened right there. That one, he's, he, 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 he's too good of a shooter to miss that bad. That one slipped. If you were Coach Reed, would you think it slipped? No, 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 no. And even if it did slip, if you're Coach Reed, you're not going to think it slipped. You know, but he won't get on him too much because he doesn't want to break his confidence, and he knows that, that that Jones is one of the few people that that can consistently make a shot. So, you know, even with the air ball, I don't think Coach Reed would beat, would beat him up too much. Shot clock, game clock, almost identical, nearly in sync, and so the Bison can hold for a final shot. Or fire away with eight seconds remaining in the half. Kyle Foster for three. That was an outstanding play right there by Cole. You know, he, he's so used to getting double teamed. You know, he invited the double right there, made the right pass to Foster in the corner who knocks it down. 
pass right on money. No hesitation right there. Bingo. And hey, coach, that's the thing about R.J. Cole. Not only does he give you 21 points tonight, he's second in the conference in assists behind NCAA and T's Cameron Langley at 6.3 assists per game, something he did a year ago when he led the league in assists. Yeah, and, and for someone that gets so much attention because of his scoring, you know, he is an unselfish player. He's, he's very good at getting into the lane and then making a decision. That time, he, he you know, he just they, they ran at him. He saw the double team coming. He snaps it uh, uh, to the corner uh, for the shot. And you see right there in, in multiple statistical categories, he's one of the tops in the conference. He told us earlier today before the Howard practice that he feels like he's doing a better job this year setting up his teammates, although the assists are about the same, trying to be more efficient. But the scoring gene is there. He learned it from his father, Robert Cole, who was a scoring machine back in the late 70s and early 80s at LIU Brooklyn. Dad went for nearly 1,800 points. And then for his son, RJ, built himself a full court in the backyard growing up in New Jersey. The officials are checking to see how much time should be on the clock. Well, you certainly grew up in a house where you had a dad who knew a thing or two about playing basketball. What's it like for R.J. Cole to have a dad like that who's guided him right from the start? No, when you look at how well he's playing now, when you look at the fact that he's the fastest person to 1,000 points in, in Howard history, it, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Now, he is smart, and his daddy is smart, because that whole conversation he gave us today about I'm trying to get my teammates more involved and try to share, you know, he's smart enough to, to say things like that. Yeah when he's going to shoot as much as he does. At least yeah. he's going to tell him, I'm looking out for you, baby. Get open. I'm going to give it to you. <laughs> Five seconds to go in the half, and Foster gives the foul. Well, H Howard has two more fouls, or one more foul to give before Maryland Eastern Shore is in the bonus. You know, so Coach Nickelberry wanted to do, they probably will foul again right here. Let him catch it. Try not to foul on the shot. Let him put it down one or two dribbles and get another foul. Jones in, Bartley out. Arudia will be the trigger man along the sideline. And they're, they're going to try to get a pin down for Andino again. Andino gives it up to Caldwell. He's able to knock down the three, and so the Maryland Eastern Shore Hawks coach get to go into the locker room. Feeling pretty good. They, that, that was great execution right there. And Dino came off knowing he was going to be highly guarded. Flips it back to Caldwell. Great, great execution right there by Maryland Eastern Shore. Going into the locker room feeling pretty good about themselves. Yeah, the redshirt junior from Santa Ana, California, gives us a halftime score of 31-25. Howard, our halftime show coming up. Halftime here in the district. Howard with a six-point lead. You know, the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference dates back to 1970, and the rich history of athletics continues. Darius Leonard just named first-team All-Pro with the Indianapolis Colts, but he's not alone playing at the highest level of pro sports out of the MEAC. Tariq Cohen as well with the Chicago Bears. And then the one guy currently in the NBA, you'll remember Kyle O'Quinn, now with the Indiana Pacers, the player of the year in this conference, seven years ago. Our NBA Wednesday doubleheader this week starts here in D.C. with the Pacers and Wizards. Then it's off to the Rose City for the Jazz and Trailblazers. Coverage begins with NBA Countdown Wednesday at 7 on ESPN and the ESPN app. Back to the district in just a moment. The home team from Howard University up by six. World. Get zero down special financing on bridal purchases with the K Jewelers credit card. Welcome back to Big Monday in the MEAC. We are in Washington, D.C. for Howard and Maryland Eastern Shore. The Bison up by six with John Thompson III. I'm Doug Sherman. Welcome back, everybody, to the Burr. And the Hawks shot very well and led for much of that first half, Coach. We, we have a game because of the Hawks shooting. Yes. You know, a team that traditionally doesn't make shots in general, let alone threes. You know, they come out, they make their first three threes, you know, and all of a sudden Howard's back on their heels. 
And then all of a sudden, this young man right here, Mr. Lott, decided to take over the game with his scoring, with his passing, with his ability to, to go inside and outside. You know, the latter part of the half, Howard recaptured the lead because of Mr. Lott, as well as because of their offensive rebounding. I mean, they have 16 missed shots and nine offensive rebounds. Well, Lott leads all scores with 11 points. Maryland Eastern Shore led uh, as late as the eight-minute mark of that first half, but then Howard went on a 14-2 run. But the Hawks closed out the half with a good final possession. Dante Caldwell hit a three, and let's see if Maryland Eastern Shore can put together another 20 good minutes here on the road at Howard. Well, you, you know, you look at this, this that first half, and R.J. Cole has two points, and... C.J. Williams only has eight. You know, ten points between those two. If, if you're Coach Reed with Maryland Eastern Shore, you can't ask for anything better than that. And at this end of the floor, Coach, you think uh, the Hawks have played it beautifully, right? Uh, no, I, I wouldn't say beautifully. But they would, <laughs> well, they, they would, played it well. Play, they played it as well as, as possibly they can play it being as shorthanded as they are. That's true. Perhaps beautifully was a little strong. Oh, very strong. Not aesthetically <laughs> pleasing, per se. But effective. Cole lobs it to the rim. And there's the combination we've been talking about. Cole to Williams. No, and th that's something we didn't see in the first half from either team. You had two transition points for Howard in the first half, two transition points for Maryland Eastern Shore in the first half. But there you go. You see Cole right there. We talked about his scoring. He's going to spread it around a little bit. Nice touch pass. Mr. Williams will go upstairs with it. Fair to say that was beautiful. That was beautiful. I'll, I'll give you that. I will give you that one. <laughs> so Williams, the first bison into double figures. And again, uh, Cole's not just to score. He sets up his teammates at a clip of 6.3 per game. And these two guys together are the 11th highest scoring duo in the country. Of course, you start with R.J. Barrett and Zion Williamson at Duke and then uh, everybody else. But we are watching as good a one-two punch as you're going to get at this level of basketball. No, at, 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 at most levels of basketball, not, not, not just this level. And that, and that duo hadn't gotten on track yet, as I just said. Only 10 points between them in the first half. And it start off the second half, you get an alley-oop dunk from Mr. Williams, and then you get R.J. Cole with that nice, pretty lefty shot. That's a beautiful shot. And that was not your normal rhythm shot right coach I mean it looked a little bit different but it was true coming off the fingertips no you know what it's not my normal rhythm shot but for RJ Cole this is nothing but normal for him right here that's every day for him <laughs> starting under $36,000 as January winds to a close, Norfolk State and North Carolina a t both undefeated as teams. But individually, we've been talking about R.J. Cole and Charles Williams. They are the two individual leading scorers in the MEAC. But how about Damani Applewhite for South Carolina State? And on and on and on, the individual performances for some of the players in this league are certainly worth noting. And we'll have an opportunity each of the next three Mondays to bring you MEAC basketball here on ESPNU. But a chance tonight to watch R.J. Cole. He and Charles Williams starting to heat up a little bit here, John, in the second half. And, and I have a question about if you've got two first-team all-conference guys in Cole and Williams who are averaging collectively nearly 40 points per game, why so far last year and this year has Howard not been able to get to the upper echelon of the standings in the MEAC? You know, that's a really good question. And, and we've placed a lot of attention on those two big-time scores. You know, what also must be noted, I think, is if you look at the Howard roster, you know, they have they have 10 freshmen and sophomores. They still have a very young team. And and they're playing. A lot of those freshmen are playing. And, and, and so, you know, you can't coach up. You can't watch film to get experience. And so they've gone through some of those growing pains. We talked about earlier, you know, they have five losses by eight points or less. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of that just comes down to the maturity, the, the, the growth, the understanding of when to make what a winning play is, and it's not always the last play of the game. And so I think the future is extremely bright for, 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 the, for the Bison here, you know, with, with, with Coach Nickelberry. You see, they started off 4-0, and and then they have what I just mentioned, those five losses by, by eight points or less. 
and, and, and you look at the teams at the top end of, of, of the, the, the MEAC right now, you, you know, the Norfolk States, the North Carolina ANTs, North Carolina Centrals, those are all veteran teams. Those are all juniors and seniors up at the top. And so this, 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 this program, I think, is heading in the right direction um, with Coach Nickelberry. How close is Howard to playing championship caliber defense? Well, and, and that's also part of being young, and, and it's part of understanding and Coach Nick getting them to understand that's how they're going to win. They, I, we, they, we've said they have an explosive offensive team, and not just with those two guys. You know, but, but the casualness that they show sometimes, and, and, and they need to take that same enthusiasm and that same pride and that same uh, excitement that they have at the offensive end, take that down the other end. I see some of the hustle stats as we track them for the Bison. You talk about the uh, the schedule that Howard plays. I find it interesting that uh, the Division I schools here in the district all get together, and, and you were a big part of that at Georgetown. From a Georgetown coach's perspective, what was that relationship like with George Washington, with American University, with the Howard Bison? You know, it, it's year to year. It's, 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 it's year to year. Season to season. You know, sometimes you, you get a chance to play a couple of local schools. Sometimes you don't. Um, you know, we don't have, or, or Washington doesn't have a, a, a situation like Philly in the Big Five. Right. You know, and, and a lot of times everyone talks about that, and it sounds good and you want to do it. You know, but in this day and age where you have 18 conference games, and then a lot of the conferences have the, the different challenges, the Big East, whomever challenge, the, the Big, 12, Big Ten, whoever they play challenge. And then you want to go to a tournament. You know, let's, let's go over to Hawaii. Or let's play in a tournament down in Charleston. And once you start adding all those things up, you realize, oh my goodness, there's only there's only space on my schedule for four or five more games. Right. And you don't want all monster games. And so, you know, scheduling is an inexact science, and and you have many masters when it comes to scheduling. From in, in certain situations, building availability, uh, and so you know, sometimes you have a young team, you don't want to do as hard. But it's it's you know, you play when you can. All the times you don't. Well, that's certainly the power conference perspective as Charles Williams knocks down the jump shot. From the MEAC perspective, I would think trying to play each of your regional rivals for a lot of reasons is a good thing every year. Well, I think the same thing applies to them. So, you know, how much are you going to get from your regional rival? Meaning a lot of these schools, and you can look at the schedule, you know, South Carolina, uh, I mean, Maryland Eastern Shore, for example, you know, they played Georgetown, NC State, St. John's, Pittsburgh, Virginia Tech. And they have to play these games for for revenue to to, to, to fund right. the athletic department. And, you know, we can talk about that a, a little a, a little when we come back from break. But you see that the, the fellas getting a little chippy out here. Yeah, we got a technical foul that they're going to hash out. We'll have the details when we come back. Folio that works for you now and as your needs change from TD Ameritrade Investment Management. A flagrant technical foul has been assessed on Savior Aquawubo because of this. As we went to break, he took the basketball after the whistle and shoved it into the back of the head of one of his opponents. The officials were right there, and so he has been assessed a technical flagrant foul and been ejected from tonight's ball game. And you see a lot of restraint by Taylor right there not to respond at all. You know, when we were talking about why hasn't Howard won more games, that's a freshman mistake. You know, you have to control your emotions. You have to control yourself. You know, it's, we're talking about an eight-point game. You know, where, where as a team, Howard has, has, has not played well. You know, so you have to control yourself better that, you know, this is when he's hearing that he's, that he's ejected for the game. And so Akwawovu's night is done. And Isaac Taylor at the free throw line. And that young man, Savior Akwawovu, is somebody who Coach Nickelberry said at the start of the year that he, th he thought he had a shot at being the next in line in terms of MEAC Rookie of the Year. Now, that hasn't played out statistically. But he is somebody who this coaching staff is very high on going forward. No, he's a presence down there. Right now, his, 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 his defense is much ahead of his offense, but he usually makes hustle plays. But he has to control himself. And that was uncalled for right there. 
And now with him out of the game, a lot easier for Maryland Eastern Shore to get to the bucket back to a four-point ball game. Yeah, and all of a sudden a four-point play right there. And, and he's downstairs in the locker room taking the shot. Maryland Eastern Shore goes back to their zone. Nice under control move by Jalen Jones, the fifth year Jaylen senior from Jones. Kinston, North Carolina. Yeah, and that was just too easy. A lot of times throwing the ball over top of the zone, which is what Howard just did, is, is there. But that time, you know, Jones caught the ball, had time to think about it, twirl around. He's just, he's going to be open down there because they're spreading out on shooters, but he can't be that open for that long. Jones from 17. That's his spot. That little area right there is his spot. And I'm still waiting for him to be more aggressive. The, 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 the Hawks need Tyler Jones to get a lot more aggressive. Now well, seven of his 11 points have come since the break. The junior from Atlantic City makes it 42-38. Corner three, Williams off the front rim. And the Hawks continue to hang around. Quickly up ahead through the hands of Taylor. And out of bounds, it's a turnover. Our next Super Tuesday doubleheader features two great rivalry games. Number 11, Kansas takes on Texas at 7 Eastern, and then at 7th ranked Kentucky, taking on the Commodores of Vanderbilt at Memorial Gymnasium in Nashville. Both games live on the ESPN app, so you can watch anywhere. Super Tuesday is presented by Boost Mobile. Let's see if Howard can get lot going again here in the second half. Well, a lot, you know, or can Cole continue to go, or can Williams continue? You know, they they have Maryland Eastern Shore has done a very good job just keeping Howard off rhythm. Howard offensively hasn't been able to get into a flow, to a rhythm, individually or collectively. Coach, that's the third foul on Brian Arudia, the junior point guard for the Hawks, and he will stay in the game at least for now for Coach Reed with 13:56 remaining in regulation. Yeah, and he's such the primary ball handler for them. He ha it, it'll be rough if he come, has to come out of the game for a stretch. Coach is just going to take a chance. We're going to stay in his zone and try. Hopefully the zone can protect can, can, can protect us as it relates to fouls. R.J. Cole. And here is Arudia. He brings it to the front court to Bartley. Off to Taylor and then back to Andino. Rudy originally con uh, committed to Nichols State when he was playing high school in El Paso. But then after a coaching change, decided to change his path and head to Maryland Eastern Shore. He's back defensively with Cole attacking. Tough shot and a chance for three. The young man can do it from the outside. He can get to the cup. You know what Cole does, which is underappreciated? He makes tough layups. I mean, this is a layup, yes. But, you, get, you know, you're dipping, you're scooping. You know, he, he's, he's consistently got in there and done that going both ways. Puts a little English on it mm. as it hits the glass. He can fill it up. He went for 42 against UNCW last December. That's his career high, season high so far. He put 31 on Cal Baptist back in November. So far, this is not a prolific scoring game for R.J. Cole. But you watch, the end of the night, he'll have his 20. I was, I was going to say, we still got 13.05 left. Yeah. He, he can put points on the board quickly. Stretches the lead back up to seven, just over seven minutes gone here in the second half. And he's trying to give... Yerudia a little taste of his own medicine. Cole is so used to being denied. They're trying to deny Yerudia now. Bad pass by Jim Fee taken away. Here comes Cole. He and Williams get him a good look. Fight for the basketball. It comes to the Hawks. They talk about the ability to handle the ball and get them into offense. And Rudy has played some for the Mexican National Basketball Program. So he is somebody with international experience. And talking to him today, Coach, interesting to talk to anybody who has to use a second language. So he has been in the States now for about seven years, but he still thinks in Spanish and translates to English. Says it's no problem on the court. 
And it certainly doesn't seem to hold him back as the guy who runs the show for Maryland Eastern Shore. It doesn't hold him back at all. He's he's translating just fine. What he has realized, or Coach Reed has realized, I should say, Howard's now gone to, to switching on all on-ball screens. And so the past two possessions, you see Yerudia come down, who Cole is checking, and, and they have Jones come up and set a ball screen. Cole ends up on Jones in the post. They tried to throw it in one time, turned it over. That time, they get to the foul line. Let's see if they do that the next time. Come back to an own ball with those two and then roll the big into the post and try to post up Cole. Well, Coach, Tyler Jones has been a problem for Howard in the second half. Nine of his 13 points Zion. coming since Cousins. the break. Zion Cousins with his first field goal of the night. And again, in they go to Jones, and he is feeling it. Mr. Jones with the post up. He's feeling it. Let's keep feeding that young man. He was sleepwalking the first half. He's got a little life to him this half. Let's keep feeding him. Cole, runner, front rims it, gets it back. Williams bangs the three. Timeout called. C.J. Williams up to 16 points, and the lead is back to eight for the Howard Bison here in D.C. Or Cine Snacks a la mode. Going fast and try order ahead to get happy hour anytime. On Saturday, Charles Williams, C.J., gave Delaware State 30 points. He's starting to heat up against Maryland Eastern Shore here in the second half, Coach. It, it, the game comes easy to him. You know, he's got really good legs. So even if he's guarded, he can just elevate and get his shot off. You know, he, he, he goes by beam. You know, and, and Kobe could do that also. Kobe get that little slight lean back. Um, you know, but he's extremely athletic. And he, you, you see his athleticism on display. You see him running hard. A lot of kids are athletic, mm -hmm. but you don't know it. Only in layup lines. You see the fancy dunks and layup lines. You say, wow, I didn't know he could do that. Williams, you see his athleticism on the court with, with his rebounds. He goes up two hands above the rim and gets him. He fills the lanes. He uses, really uses his legs on his, on, on his jump shot where he can get it off. He's starting to warm up, like you said. Well, again, he uh, takes the nickname from Kobe Bryant's middle name, Bean. Lock with the one-handed hammer. <laughs> Speaking of athleticism. And the physicality we were talking about out of the 6'4", 190-pound redshirt junior from Shreveport. It's a 10-point ball game. Now Cole is called for the foul. But they, he loves the ball right there. You know, he's athletic. That kind of caught me off guard. It, 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 it caught me and it caught Caldwell off guard also. Having a little fun with his teammates. Referees let it go. Good. Back in the mid-80s at Princeton, you ever dunked like that over somebody? No. No, no. <laughs> but I, I threw a lot of passes to guys that did. There you go. Okay. Cousins picks up his third personal foul. Been a quiet night so far, at least on the offensive end for the sophomore from Upper Marlboro, Maryland, out of Frederick Douglass High School. No, no, let's be honest. It's been a quiet night offensively for most of the Bison. They, they've, they have a 10-point lead, but they've been sleepwalking most, most, of, most of this game. Deep position once again, and able to finish once again. This time it's Isaac Taylor. No, good, good coaching by Coach Reed. He, he sniffed something out. I mean, they, they're, they're trying to ram it down Howard's throats now by just going to post-ups very successfully, I should say. Going to post-ups, you know, Taylor right there, and they've been doing it with Jones. And it seems like they've been able to do it and more willing to do it as Lott connects ever since the ejection of the center for Howard. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good call right there. 15 points now for Lott. He and Williams share team high for Howard. 15 points for Tyler Jones. Sets the pace for the Hawks. They go right back inside to Jones again. Blocking foul.
Well, that's a tough assignment for Jalen Jones. They list him at 6'5", 200. I'm not so sure he's that big down in the low post. Yeah, but you know what? If, if, if they're going to list him as that, he better play like that. <laughs> you know? If, if we're going to put you in the program to 6'5", 200, you better play 6'5", 200. Did you ever have players lobby you for a bigger listing? I don't think head coaches have anything to do with that or do they? No, head coaches do. I actually, we like to do it the other way. We, we would make people smaller than they really were. So you come out expecting a 6'7 guy, and then you get out there and it's a 6'9 guy. Lot is hot. Just, just, just another day at the park. Looked to me like they were both making a play on the ball, right? I, I think so. The lot went down hard. Well, now with that angle, I take that back perhaps. Isaac Taylor <laughs> got him across the chest pretty good. He got the ball first. <laughs> but I'd be upset too. No, I agree. I agree. And once again, very capable officiating crew. We're at the monitor. They're going to get it right. It's funny how from one angle to another to another, you can come up with a different conclusion. Yeah, initially I thought it was clean. You know, I thought they just went for the ball. See, lot, lots over there dancing. He's, he's fine. Get your attention, though. <laughs> you get down that hard. They're also making sure nobody came off either bench. Nice job by the coaching staff to make sure nobody gets in there. Now, you know, and that got my attention, how Coach Nickelberry, you saw he immediately sprinted to make sure yep. uh, all of his players stayed, stayed on the bench. Now, normally the assistants are assigned that job, you know, but Coach Nickelberry, he's got, that was his first look at it right there, his yep. first instinct to make sure no one leaves the, the bench area. No one did. Well, he doesn't have as many assistants here as you had at Georgetown. He's got to do it himself. Uh, I don't know about that now. NCAA rules regulate how many assistants you have. And so I think I think all 350 whatever have the same amount of assistants. 353 these days. Yeah. Is that something a head coach would coach his assistants on? 100%. Yeah. That you talk about that. If there's a fight, this is what everyone is to do. Yeah. Orlandis Poole, one of the three officials, has just told us, first of all, that he doesn't want to come back over here again to talk to us. I understand <laughs> that. But secondly, and not surprisingly, Isaac Taylor has been ejected from the game. Yeah, and, and, and looking at that angle, it, 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 I understand the call. Yep. I mean, he, he did get the ball, but he kind of came down. He came down on a lot pretty hard. So each team has lost a big here in the second half. Here we see it one more time. Yeah, he, he he wanted to he went for the ball, but he also wanted to make sure Lot felt him a little bit. And he did. Yes, he did. We we talked about Coach Nickelberry doing a good job of, of protecting the bench. The Howard players did a great job of grabbing Lot and making sure that he couldn't go anywhere. 23 Jalen Jones in particular, great job. Of, of, of grabbing his teammate right there before things got out of control. And with all that said, Clifford Reed's Hawks are still hanging around to look up. You know, if you take this game, Coach, in segments, five minutes or ten minutes, they have been able to hang. Of course, they led for the simple majority of the first half. They trailed at halftime by six, and here we are midway through the second half, roughly so, and it's still a single-digit deficit. They're still right here. If, now, if they can hit one of those spurts like they started off the game with, with they made three threes, yep. who knows what we have. And again, when these two teams met earlier this month in a game that was played at uh, 
Princess and Maryland, the home of the Hawks. It was a 40-point blowout by the Bison. Much different story here tonight in Washington, D.C. Catch and shoot. Williams around and in. A very friendly rim to our left. He gets it. He can get a shot off whenever he wants. And you're right. It's a true jump shot. Yes, it is. He Those elevates. Legs. Those legs. 18 points for the junior out of Millwood High School in Richmond. Dante Caldwell finds the open man in the corner. Great look for the Hawks. Jim Fee just couldn't knock it down. Cole lob and the finish. Chad Lott says, take that. Chad Lott says, take that. After R.J. Cole said, here, take this. <laughs> that was beautiful by Cole. Second transition alley-oop for the second half for the highlight reel. Set up both times by R.J. Cole. Pushing it off the dribble. That's with the left hand. Well, I guess it will be with the left. He's the lefty, so he didn't get as much credit for that one. But that was a beautiful, that was a beautiful pass right there. Mm. And you see, you know, early in the day, Lot dunked on someone. Now he gets out in transition. That's nice. R.J. Cole was a three-star recruit coming out of St. Anthony High School in New Jersey. He's the last of Hall of Fame head coach Bob Hurley Sr.'s great point guards. You, know, you think about the lineage. Before the school closed down, R.J. would uh, be the last. Followed guys like David Rivers, who went on to Notre Dame, Terry DeHair at Seton Hall, Tyshawn Taylor, of course, the Hurley brothers as well. R.J. Cole belongs in that category. No, without a doubt. And, and, and like he's playing with Coach Hurley, well-schooled, knows how to play, confident. You know, people talk about three stars. All that star stuff doesn't matter all the time. Yep. You know, and, and evaluators as well as coaches make mistakes when evaluating sometimes. But this kid's a player. He's a player. You said his daddy scored 1,800 points, did you say? Yep. Eight, six, six. So he's, he's wired to score also. But then also you see he's, he's he's got eyes. He sees. You can't teach the vision that he had right there to see that in the delivery. Last year, he was, as a freshman, the seventh leading scorer in the country. Statistically, his year as a freshman was very comparable to Trey Young at Oklahoma, where Trey Young led the country in scoring and assists. Cole did the same in this conference and, again, was among the national leaders at uh, nearly 24 points per game. Scoring has come down a bit this year, but his goal is to win more games if that means scoring fewer points. Absolutely. And that's also the power of television. No one's seen him. No one, no one's seen R.J. Cole. Well, we're happy to be seeing him in the Bison tonight. They have stretched their lead to the largest of the ball game, 60-44. Little 6-0 burst now for the Bison for this largest lead of the night. And again, it was only a minute ago, it seems, that it was a four-point game. It, it, it literally. But that's, that, this, this, uh, is it Clark Kellogg that talks about spurtability? I think so, yeah. You know, this, this Bison team has spurtability, you know, because of just how dynamic Cole and Williams are. But also they have other pieces, that players that can score, Lot being just one of them. And Dino, the fifth-year senior from Fort Lauderdale with a pair of free throws. You know, and Dino was the MEAC Rookie of the Year in 2015. So we were watching three of the last four MEAC Rookies of the Year perform tonight. And Dino missed all of last season because of shoulder surgery on his left shoulder. That's his non-shooting shoulder. And he said that uh, even though he feels pretty much 100%, he has lost some range of motion in that shoulder. He still can fill it up, though. Sure can. Hasn't that had too many opportunities tonight. Howard's done an outstanding job of switching out on him and not giving him clean looks. Williams is wide open, guys. How about that pogo stick? Down and right back up. They keep forgetting that he's over in that corner. That cross court pass is open every time. I think he's made enough of them where I'd step out on him. Well, enough to total 21 points and counting. Five of nine from beyond the arc.
from the short corner no. And, that, and what right there, you see Williams going up for that rebound. That's what he shows, you see his athleticism in all parts of the game. Lott feeds Williams, draws a crowd, back out to Lott for three. The putback by Toure nearly fell. But instead, Maryland Eastern Shore coming back the other way. Quickly to the bucket. Caldwell couldn't convert. Seven minutes to go. Jones lost it. Back to Andino. Long three. The shoulder looked okay right there. Sure did. Out of bounds. The officials confer, and they say it'll stay at this end. Well, number two in white continues to provide the highlights here tonight. Whether he's scoring the basketball or setting up his teammates, the Bison are on a run up 63-46. Back at Bird Gymnasium in Washington, D.C. A little big Monday in the MEAC. Howard has stretched a lead out to 63-46. Sports Center tonight after TCU Texas Tech with Steve Levy and John Anderson. They'll take an inside look at the Warriors' 10-game winning streak, plus Duke-Notre Dame post-game reaction and analysis, and Super Bowl opening night sights and sounds. Sports Center, 11 p.m. Eastern on ESPN and the ESPN app. John Thompson over on ESPN right now. Duke has been having its way with Notre Dame. Last score I see is 75-56, uh, and I'm guessing on SportsCenter, we might see a dunk or two from Zion Williamson, who, oh, by the way, 25 points, 10 to 12 shooting so far tonight. Can you Young believe man's pretty good. <laughs> he sure is. Young man's pretty good. Nine rebounds, knocked down his only three-point attempt. No, and I agree with what he said a few weeks ago. He's not just a dunker. Mm -mm. He's a basketball player. Very good passer, great ball handler, and then uh, a physical skill set that is unmatched. And a, a, a physical skill set and a body. It's just, it's just, everything about him is, is, is unique. And on top of that, he seems like a terrific young man. Absolutely. I've had Duke a couple of times this year, and... Uh, he seems to treat everybody the exact same way. Great respect all the way around. Foul on the drive. Jalen Jones went down hard, holding his head. You know, we uh, commented on uh, the fact that uh, as we take another look at the foul that will send Jones to the line. Yeah, it, it looks like he, he bumped into Cousins' knee on the way down. He fell into his own teammate's knee. You know how the lead went from four to a lot? <laughs> Williams did a lot of that. He had uh, three three-pointers in a four-and-a-half-minute stretch. C.J. Williams leads all scorers with 21 points. And that is potentially a game-winning stretch put forth by the all-conference junior from Richmond. And, and they're, they're so explosive. You know, you, you look at this game and you say, you know, Cole has been pretty quiet. For the most part, you feel like Williams has been pretty quiet. But at the end of the day, you're going to look up and they're still going to have their points. Yep. R.J. Cole working on a double-double, 10 points, 8 assists, a couple of steals. Howard basketball. Out of bounds, last touch. Off possession, Bison, substitution. You know, you, you see right there, Jones gets hit in the head, and he's he's struggling a little bit. But he was going to shoot those foul shots before he came out. <laughs> now, Coach, I'm okay. I'm okay. Let me shoot my foul shots. You know, and then one or two players later, Coach, I, I need one. Yep. Can't leave two points out there. No, go get them. no. Too hard to come by. Two freebies at that? Arudia, no. And the putback is good by Jim Fee, junior from Brampton, Ontario. I think I heard a number the other day, Coach, where there are now 131 Canadians 
playing in Division I college basketball these days? Well, you know, it, it's staying basketball is a global sport, a global game, and, and you know, a lot because of what David Stern and now Adam Silver and the NBA have done is has broadened that, that globalness of basketball. And so, you know, Canada is just north of the border, as they say, and so I'm surprised the number's not higher than that. And I think the Toronto Raptors and, and the popularity of Vince Carter had a lot to do with that with this generation as it's come up. No, without a doubt. And as you look, and as you look around at international competition, which I've been fortunate to be a, a part of a little bit, the, the, the Canadian teams are among the stronger teams, particularly at the younger age levels. Well, led by R.J. Barrett, they won the U-19. Correct. Sixty-six fifty. Bison in control. That's a long two-point shot for Brian Arudia. Give him eleven points. He's putting together a real nice junior year for Coach Reed. Among the league leaders in assists and in steals. You know, in this Maryland Eastern Shore team, they're undermanned. We've talked about that. We you know we've talked about Cheeseman being out. We showed the graphic earlier. We said you know, told they've had about 90 missed games because of injuries cumulatively but I like the way they're playing hard you know they seem to be in very good spirits at today's shoot around they haven't given up they're just undermanned right now coach Reed is playing a style of play that he has to play to try to win games and, and he's, he's trying to put his team in the best position to win and it's just they're just so undermanned it's, it's, it's on a night in night out basis is hard well they uh, average losing each game by about 20 points a night that's tough to take and it's tough to keep a team playing as hard as they are this late in the year i would think no but they have and, yeah and without, it's, it's extremely hard not just to lose but to lose how they're losing but they come in with 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 a solid game plan every time and the kids execute as, as best they can Cole able to save it. Toure has it taken away by Frost. Numbers. Jimphy. And he'll be shooting free throws when we come back. And that just illustrated, illustrates it right there. I mean, totally outnumbered situation. Yerudia makes a great tip and a steal. Saves it everything. Just hustle. Guys are all over the place. Boom. No, you're not going to get this one. Hustle plays. We're not giving up. We're still here to play. Well, in the long, proud tradition of Howard University basketball, one name stands among the rest. His name is Larry Spriggs. His number 35 is hanging in the rafters here at Bird Gymnasium. He was a fourth-round pick of the LA Lakers in 1981. And, oh, by the way, he's got an NBA championship ring. He was a part-time starter for the 85 NBA champs, along with guys you may have heard of. Magic Johnson, James Worthy, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Pretty good stuff. And the list of alumni outside of athletics, it's not just in the MEAC, not just at HBCUs. This list of alumni, Coach, is as good as any in the country. No, and the, the danger of putting that graphic up there is how it's one of those schools that you start talking about the alums and who's part of that fraternity, being the alumni. You can go on and on and on and on. This is just one small s snippet of the people that have come out of this this institution that have made a difference in the world and so like you almost don't want to put that up there because you there's there's countless people you know we, we could have spent 20 minutes talking about the howard alumni well i can't help myself i'm going to add a few more names to that list how about debbie allen felicia rashad mayors david dinkins from new york city andrew young from atlanta we showed tony morrison a, a nobel and pulitzer prize winning author thurgood marshall Gus Johnson in our profession, as well as Stan Barrett, late night Los Angeles Sports Center anchor here on ESPN. I know Gus. Gus is going to be mad that he wasn't on that. That Gus didn't make that graphic right there. It's an ESPN broadcast. <laughs> he'll understand, but he'll still be mad. <laughs> well, it really is something, and I always love to come to this school. 
You just take a look at the Founders Library, which opened in 1938. That's the signature building on this beautiful campus here in D.C., a city that's very near and dear to your heart. It is, and I, I spent a lot of time on this campus coming up. Spent a lot of time playing in this gym also, to tell you the truth. Rims seem pretty nice. You know, when, when I played, you know, I, I was wired to score like Williams. They all rims are nice to me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I look at Coach Reed over there, and, and we just finished saying how this team, they keep executing, they keep fighting, you know, and, and he's undermanned. And, and, you know, you look at the life of a lot of people as coaches in the HBCUs, and, and you look at their record, and you say, oh, well, this guy's, for well, his career, he's around 500. And, and you don't take into account that so many of the pre-league games you have to play. We talked about it earlier, you know. Maryland Eastern Shores played Georgetown. They played NC State. They played St. John's. They played Pittsburgh. They played Virginia Tech. And they have to play those games to bring in money to the athletic department. There's some really outstanding coaches in this conference, some really outstanding coaches in the SWAC, some really outstanding coaches at other HBCUs that people don't realize it if you just look at the records, if you just look because they don't understand the plight that they have and the hardships that they have that other coaches have the luxury of not having to worry about. And we see it in football as well, where these schools have to go on the road and play some of the big boys. Well, I'll tell you what, we have seen one dunk after another for the Howard Bison. This time it's Jalen Jones getting into the act. I think his head is feeling okay right now, Coach. His head's fine. <laughs> his head is fine. You see, all of a, uh, it's been a close game. You look up and now it's almost 20 points. Coach Nickelberry's getting the starters out getting some of the younger young fellas a little experience this last 139. And what Coach Nickelberry is going to be looking for, you know, a lot of times as a fan, when the guy that never gets to play gets in, you're like screaming, shoot it, shoot it. But as a coach, you want to see those guys come out and do what they do every day in practice. Want to see, you want to see them execute and not just run up and down and look sloppy. We'll see how they do this last 139. Well, I tell you what, I was one of those end of the bench guys in high school when I got in. I was looking to shoot. I wasn't looking to execute. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. Understood. Jones. And you know what? It's both Brian Arudia and Ryan Andino, the two starting guards from Maryland Eastern Shore, appropriately uh, pointed out to Coach and I earlier today. You know, it is great to win regular season games, but ultimately we've got to get our roster as whole and as healthy as we can be going into uh, Norfolk to play the MEAC Championship Tournament. And it's all about trying to put together two or three wins at the right time of the year. No, and it was refreshing to hear that, that like, they haven't given up. You're talking about a team that's only won three games this year. And I'm not going to sit here and say they, they, they were confident, but they understood, okay, for, for, with the hand that we've been dealt, what we have to focus on is getting ready for the conference tournament. And they understand they have injuries. They've got, if we can be healthy, if everyone can be playing, if we can be in our top gear come tournament time, we have a shot. And, and for a team that's 3-19, that's and 19, about to be 3-20, and 20, that's a goal that they have, that they're still working extremely hard towards that, that, that as a group, they uniformly are working for that. They haven't quit by any stretch, of, by any means, you know, in spite of the, you know, as you mentioned earlier, average loss of 20 points. But th their attitude doesn't show that. Their, their hustle and their caring doesn't show that. They still have a goal that they're fighting for. And keep in mind, they're hoping to get their best player, A.J. Cheeseman, back from a broken hand in their next game Saturday against South Carolina State. That would give them a month back together with him to get things going. Officials letting them play a little bit. They're still playing hard. They're still playing hard. They're still playing hard, and that's not going to change. I, I, can I be selfish right here? Sure. I would love to see the young man 
number 24, who just checked in, Justin Cotton. You know, you said you want to see him get a bucket. Mm -hmm. It's a young man that spent many years at the John Thompson basketball camp. Ah, okay. <laughs> Senior from Clinton, Maryland, out of Bishop McNamara. <laughs> Well, he's got about 17 seconds to get it up. I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> you know, but he came to my camp since he was like eight, nine years old through high school. Number 24 in white. You get a chance to say hello to him earlier today? I did speak to him earlier today. I also practiced a little bit. Well, good. Well, I know when you come into a gym, especially here in Washington, D.C., folks are happy to see you. Have a great regard for you and your family. And I'm sure for that young man, Justin Cotton, it was quite a treat to uh, be mentored by you coming up. Well, he's, gradu he's graduating this spring, wants to go into sports marketing, sports management, looking to get his graduate degree in that, in that, in that field. Give it to 24 and White. I'm just playing. Bethea is going to dribble it out. No, and that's what he should do. Absolutely. That's Impressive second do. half for Howard. They were given a ball game by Maryland Eastern Shore, but the Bison win it 72-57. That'll do it from Washington, D.C. For John Thompson the third. I'm Doug Sherman. So long from the district, college basketball continues on Big Monday. When they take on the Norfolk State.